Greetings and welcome to the Financial Inclusion 2020 launch webinar. I'm Suthi Cheskin, Senior Advisor for the Center for Financial Inclusion at Acción, and I am delighted to welcome each of you to this conversation. This is a conversation about building a movement toward full financial inclusion for all, and joining me as speakers are, in alphabetical order, Bill Guida, Head of Global Mobile Products for Visa, Inc., Graham McMillan, Senior Program Officer for Financial Inclusion, City Foundation, Kate McKee, Senior Advisor at CGAP, the Consultative Group to Assist the Poor, Elizabeth Rhine, Managing Director of the Center for Financial Inclusion at Acción, Michael Schlein, President and CEO of Acción, and Evelyn Stark, Senior Program Officer, Financial Services for the Poor, of the Global Development Program at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Thanks to each of you for joining us for what I'm sure will be a lively and interesting conversation. Our goal is to accelerate the pace and quality of financial inclusion, and doing that will require a diverse set of actors. This webinar gets us off to a great start with over 500 people signed up, and the people range from academics to business people, from microfinance institutions to multinationals, from policymakers to bankers, from churches to central bankers, from insurance providers to investors. Among the many countries represented on this webinar are Ecuador and the Philippines, Egypt, India, Kenya, Australia, United States, China, Mexico, Pakistan, and quite a few more. We're delighted that in addition to people participating from all of these parts of the world, we are welcoming representatives from the Center's founding partner, Credit Suisse, as well as our project partner, Western Union, and our most recent supporter and principal partner, which is MasterCard. So we're going to start off with a thanks to Citi for its leadership in sponsoring this project and to Visa for its early sponsorship and coming along as a leading and principal partner for our work. And we're going to ask a quick question. This is going to be a lightning round. But we would like to know from our speakers, what is happening in the world today that makes you think financial inclusion could be possible by 2020? And Graham McMillan of City, would you please kick us off with just a sentence? Uh, thank you, Susie. One sentence is impossible, but I'll do my best. There's a famous American author and columnist named Tom Friedman who coined the phrase, the world is flat. And I think in many ways the increasing interconnectedness and globality, not only of institutions but people, will ensure that the pace of this closing the gap and reaching full financial inclusion makes that possible. Thank you, Graham. And Bill Guida in California, I'd like to kick that to you. Again, we're so delighted that Visa joined City as a lead partner for the Financial Inclusion 2020 project. And we'd like to hear what do you think is happening in the world today that makes you think financial inclusion could be possible by 2020? For me, I think one of the big factors is going to be the continued proliferation of, of mobile devices that are really reaching the, the very bottom of the period. And I think that these mobile, uh, of the pyramid rather, and I think these mobile devices are going to be a, a key enabling technology for financial inclusion now through 2020. And it's not just these basic phones anymore. We're seeing, you know, $20, $30 smartphones, which provides, you know, more capabilities than people imagined, as I said, at the very base of the pyramid. And I think mobile as an enabling technology is going to help us drive towards financial inclusion. Thank you, Bill. And I'm going to kick it now to Evelyn Stark of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Evelyn, what's your answer? Thanks. I uh, fully agree with Bill, and I think that having people, more and more people on digital networks will allow us to get a better understanding of their financial habits and allow us to use the data to create and develop and deliver more financial products. Thanks, Evelyn. Michael Schlein in Boston. What do you think is happening in the world today? So in addition to our work with microfinance institutions, we've been doing venture capital with um, startups all focused on financial services at the base of the pyramid. And what's incredibly exciting is we're seeing hundreds of new companies that are bold, innovative, and disruptive. And some of them will fail, and some of them may change the world. Excellent. Kate McKee of CGAP. Well, since I get to have to go last here, my original answer was African teenagers 
wanting smartphones and being able to buy them for 20 bucks used in the Kampala market. But Bill and Evelyn already said that. So I think uh -huh. another powerful factor on the demand side will be consumers being organized and having the means, including with those smartphones, to be demanding more from financial service providers and articulating directly what they want and whether they think they're getting it. Thank you, Kate. And I do want to hear from Elizabeth Ryan, Managing Director of the Center for Financial Inclusion. Tell us about your, your thoughts about what's happening in the world and how will that affect financial inclusion by 2020. Well, I want to pick up on Kate's mention of the demand side. We've been looking at what's likely to happen to incomes of lower income people around the world over the next decade. And we are seeing huge numbers of people move from a level in which they're living at $1 or $2 a day to a level at which they're living at, at more like 4 to $10 a day. Enormous portions of the developing world are making that transition, and that makes them um, have the, that, that enables them to have the income that they are going to need to be interested in using more sophisticated financial services. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I will add my own thought, which is that I think the thing that is making this possible is the fact that each of you is on this webinar. And I, I know we have a, a list of some of the people participating, and I want to just point out the Rural Bankers Association in the Philippines, people from the World Bank, the National Banking and Securities Commission in Mexico, and the World Agroforestry Center in Kenya. We have Barclays and HSBC, we have Sadan in New Delhi, we have Basics, and we have people from the United Methodist Church as well as GSMA. So with that kind of diversity of stakeholders and many people of different geographical positions as well as stakeholder types joining in, I think we can come together and, as Michael said earlier, make a big change in the world. So Elizabeth Ryan. Tell us about Financial Inclusion 2020. How did it get started? What is the vision behind this initiative? Thank you, Susie. The Center for Financial Inclusion is leading this project, which in 2013 is having a very intensive year that's centered around three major efforts. Um, and before I describe the efforts, I'll just say a, a couple words about why we're doing it. And one reason we're doing it is because we want to be aspirational and look towards the future. So many times our discussions about financial inclusion are solving next month's problem or this month's problem, but not really uh, looking at where can we take this, how far uh, into the future can we peer. Um, and we find that when we take a future-oriented perspective, um, many opportunities come into focus that were not there before. A second reason, which really relates to what Susie said about all of you on the, on the webinar, is that we want to help build a greater financial inclusion community. And one of the things that's exciting about what's going on in financial inclusion right now is that um, many new players are entering, um, but the players don't talk to each other all that well quite often. Um, and it is because they are new to the field, uh, because they come into it with very different perspectives. We come out of a microfinance background, and uh, microfinance has a tradition of a very tight-knit community. Um, and, and it may not be possible to create that kind of community in, in the financial inclusion space, but we can have more of a community. And, and so uh, we're hoping to build that. And finally, we want to make sure that clients are the focus of the financial inclusion discussion. And what we see is that it's easy to count people. And when you just look at the numbers, the projections that we can come up with about numbers of people served are very exciting. But we want to also make sure that what people receive is what they need and that they receive services that they actually uh, really want to use that fit their lifestyles and that help them with their financial needs. So that's kind of the why. Onto the what is what you're looking at in this slide, which the what is, is three big pieces. Uh, one piece is a research piece that we call Mapping the Invisible Market, where we're looking at the big forces that are sort of external to 
financial inclusion but that will show where financial inclusion is going to go, such as demographics and ep- economic growth. The second is, and, and really the heart of the piece, is the roadmap to financial inclusion, where we are working with, at this point, more than 50 different organizations to create roadmaps for the major actions needed by which players to move us to the kind of financial inclusion we'd like to see. These will come together towards the end of 2013 in a global forum to be held in London, which will kick off the completed roadmap and help motivate the various players to take the action steps that we are coming up with through the roadmap process. So moving on, just to show you where we are working, the roadmap is based on five working groups, each taking one of the major threads or themes in financial inclusion. You can see there who's chairing the groups and what the the groups are focused on. It's, It's everything from looking at financial capability of clients to looking at what technology makes possible, how products can be designed to better meet meet client needs, and how the systems can be structured to ensure greater client protection and and, uh, transparency of data about clients that can be used to help them qualify for products. Moving on, we're very excited about the Global Forum that will be taking place in October in London that's going to, to bring key actors together. We're doing our best to make this a conference that is not sort of a, a standard conference, but is an action-generating event. And when we look to what we hope to achieve with this, moving to the next slide, we want to see this process generate more momentum around financial inclusion that includes more dialogue between the providers and the policymakers and, a, and the creation of a more of a shared understanding among them. We are promoting the development or the, the, the spark that gets new relationships started by bringing collaborators from many different settings into play. One particular concern of ours is to make sure that microfinance takes its rightful place in the financial inclusion world because it has so much to offer, and so we're very interested in seeing that role bloom. And finally, we do believe that political will is one of the important ingredients for achieving financial inclusion, and so this project will help to build that. Let me finish there and turn it back to Susie. Thank you, Elizabeth. The next person we're going to hear from is Graham McMillan, and Graham has been a close partner at every step of the way along with many, many people around the globe at City who have actively participated in helping to shape this project. And we are so grateful for City's strategic partnership as well as significant financial support for Financial Inclusion 2020. Graham, the City Foundation has a long history of financial inclusion work and in developing partnerships. So can you share with us what does City believe is the potential for this partnership and why should others join in? Thank you, Susie. I just want to recognize all the the partners that are here at the table and those that are uh, coming to us through the phone. It is, I think, reflective of what this entire process is meant to be, which is inclusive, uh, collaborative, and at scale and global. City is really engaged because we are just last year celebrated our 200th anniversary. And I think in many ways to have accomplished 200 years of operating as as a going concern and providing services to clients around the world, you need to do so through innovation and relationships through community. And in many ways, uh, the financial inclusion 2020 process is reflective of the future. And I think we like to believe that this process is in many ways creating the next 100, 200 year path for city. And also recognizing that our relationship, the city foundation's relationship with Axion goes back almost 50 years. And I think we couldn't think of a better partner to, to, to collaborate with and be supportive of the process. I would also just note that city really fundamentally believes that we are a global company, but what's necessary in this process is to create a set of principles and a framework for, in effect, the interoperability of different actors. How do we create a common platform for us to have the same language and the same set of objectives and goals? That, I believe, will come out of this process, not only in the event in London, but after that and going forward. So we're quite excited to be a part of the process to engage our many city colleagues around the world from the various businesses and from the many countries that we represent. 
Thank you, Graham. And it's a good reminder that we can do more together than we can do each individually. So, um, Gaida, we are so grateful for Visa's uh, lead partnership in this project. And you are not only a business leader in the largest global technology payments company, but you have very graciously been chairing our technology working group for Financial Inclusion 2020. As a result of your experience in that working group process, uh, what are your insights about how that's playing out in building a roadmap to financial inclusion? First thing I would say is, as you know, we were tasked to look at you know technology-enabled business models as part of the the broader effort for financial inclusion 2020, and and I think that you know the first thing that we benefited from was really the diversity I'd say of, of both the talent and the perspective of my colleagues. Um, on this working group. Most of them are on the call, hopefully all of them are on the call, and we have representatives from you know, NGOs, uh, the banking sector, the mobile network operators se sector, people that have been pioneers in, in mobile, the mobile payment space, myself representing a payments network, and, and I'd say that we've really got the right people you know, focusing on how we advance technology-enabled business models for financial inclusion. I think the first insight that we had was that I think we quickly got to consensus that the technology, the development itself, the continued pace of innovation um, really didn't need our guidance. You know, we're, we're seeing leapfrogs in technology in emerging markets to enable financial inclusion. And so I think we very quickly really to focus on how we could guide the business models. The technology would look after itself, that the pace of innovation continues. How could we guide the business models to make the current and future efforts towards financial inclusion more scalable, more robust, and, 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 and over time more interoperable? Even having done that, however, and decided really not to focus on the core technology, there was a broad range of issues that we could have focused on. And, and again, I think the, the group worked hard to really focus on three areas that we thought were really relevant to providing these business model enablers for technology on the one hand, but also where we can probably do some, some good work. And, and the three that we looked at and, and the, that we're focusing on today is one in the area of regulation. I mean, we've all seen, as an example, the effect that good or bad or old or new regulation can have on the success of these financial inclusion efforts in emerging markets. And we believe as a group that a key enabler of these business models or the success of business models will be a framework or regulatory environment that governments can model uh, to really drive financial inclusion. And there's, and there's enough examples now where we as a working group can look at best practices, perhaps develop a framework on what a, an ideal regulatory environment would look like to promote financial inclusion. And so I think that's one area that we focused on, and I think that's, that's, that's going to be a key area um, for this group to work on. The second one was, was interoperability. Um, we've had a lot of active discussions on what interoperability means, the timing of interoperability. You know, do we need to get these businesses to scale before we really focus on connecting these networks to provide more value-added services and, and really building the network effect? But I'd say there's broad agreement as well that, that to define the principles of interoperability, to identify best practices where interoperability has helped to drive scale or, or further financial inclusion in particular markets, and, and outline a roadmap towards interoperability that respects the role of the various players, whether it's a mobile network operator or a financial institution, um, I think that's also very important work that we're focused on. And, and obviously, from Visa's perspective, um, we think that is going to be an important part of growth in the medium term for the, the many activities that are going on in these markets. The third area we're focusing on is, is really around consumer information. And again, you know, given the fact that there's more than you know, 100 financial inclusion or mobile programs in developing markets and more than you know, 100 planned, we, we think now that there's an opportunity to capture consumer insights to, to really start to describe and define what are the best, say, marketing practices that drive both awareness and adoption of these services. How can you use customer data, you know, that's being driven for the first time because it's almost impossible to get this data in other ways um, to improve the quality of these services and, and as people's needs become more sophisticated from basic payments to microfinance, as you, as you mentioned, or, or over time to a more traditional banking relationship, how can we use uh, customer data and what we learn about these customers to facilitate that journey and, and to accelerate uh, the efforts that are going on in these markets? And so I think have identified those three priorities, we're really now focused on how we bring them to life. And, and it's really going to be a combination of communications, and we think that's going to be very important, and this call is obviously part of that. As I said, best practices, collating research and being able to guide people who want more information on these, but also developing 
frameworks or concrete recommendations for governments or implementers of these programs based on some of the principles that we're discussing in the group. So I, I would say that we're off to a, a, a very good start. I, I think we're, we're kind of hitting the, the meat of the project now that we've focused on these three areas and, and we've really brought together a lot of the information. Um, and again, I'm just delighted to have the, the, the breadth of both experience and points of view that I have on the working group. And, and I look forward to kind of some successful outputs over the next few months. Bill, thank you so much. And that was a great preview of the work of the working group and of the roadmaps to financial inclusion to come. You talked about one, which is on technology, and we have four other roadmaps. Those will all be available on our website at financialinclusion2020.org starting on February 15th. So we will be inviting all of you to read them. They will be in draft form, and we expect that we will be making significant changes to them after you comment and give your input. And that's an invitation to everybody who's on this webinar. I'd like to turn to Evelyn Stark. Evelyn, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is involved in financial inclusion and has a, a significant strategy of digital payments. Um, and I know you've been doing a lot of work to look at how digital payments can open up new worlds and product design as, as part of that end goal of full financial inclusion. So can you talk to us about that strategy? Sure. Thanks, Susie, and thanks to all the organizers of Financial Inclusion 2020 webinar and those of you listening. We do believe that financial services have the potential to help poor people grasp opportunities and to get out of poverty and the potential to offer, offer safety net products to stay out of poverty. We are part of two working groups, the Technology, Clients, and Products working group, which tie in very closely to our strategy. We believe and the evidence demonstrates that technology can lower the cost dramatically in the financial ecosystem and reach large numbers of poor people in very short periods of time. This, coupled with agent infrastructure that we see in mobile money and agent banking, has already led to huge numbers of people being brought into the financial system and a significantly lower cost than building out bank branches. We have several pieces of work, grants, and research underway to better document and disseminate the cost structures and the business case for financial services, which we will be sharing broadly. The partners that we are working with are trying to reach poor people digitally, and we're finding that, for example, in the last quarter of 2012, 45% of adult Tanzanians had used mobile money, which is delivered by one of three different mobile companies, and that's about 10 million people. We often hear that mobile is confined to urban areas, but 27% of rural women living below a dollar a day, dollar and a quarter a day, reported using mobile money. So we really do think that this is reaching poor people. Of course, payments is not the end game, and we should not think that we've won if people only have access to payments. But we already see some digital savings, loans, insurance, and higher purchase, and we think that there's more to come on that. Obviously, Kenya is a world leader in this space. We're there, we've seen the introduction of Mshwari, which is an mpesa enabled savings and loan account from Commercial Bank of Africa. And they reached a million people and a few hundred thousand small loans in just over one month. In Kenya, you can see equity, eight equity banks agents who are also increasing account activity outside of extensive branch infrastructure, growth in clients, decreasing dormant accounts. Um, and allowing equity to use their expensive branch infrastructure for higher value transactions. Um, and COPA is uh, providing a higher purchase style solar light product, which has a SIM card embedded in it. If you want to turn your lights on, you pay for it. Um, it's about the same cost of kerosene candles and flashlight batteries, all within uh, so within a very rapid period of time, you have people switching from kerosene to a solar light, and this is because of the mobile technology. We also see the potential in what Ignacio Mas and Colin Mayer call future payments. We know that poor people know that they have something they have to pay for in three months, school fees, fertilizer for the next harvest season, or in expectation of a medical need. What if they could just scroll through a phone menu and choose something that says, what's your next future payment? And choose school fees. The interactive menu could ask, how much is it going to cost? You could say $30. It will tell you you need to pay $2.50 every week. You can get personalized SMSs reminding you to make the payment for your young scholar or congratulating you on making the payment. Somebody who's working with an NGO getting prenatal messages on their phone 
could also be reminded to save for the birth of the baby. So we think that the technology in the hands of poor people has the real potential, and we see a lot of creativity coming out of this space. So that's where we're really excited to continue our efforts there. Evelyn, thank you. I, I think what you've introduced into this conversation is the cool factor <laughs> with some really interesting innovations in product design and technology. Kate McKee of CGAP, you are a wonderful advocate for the fact that financial inclusion is about more than access to financial services, and you've talked a lot about the importance of use and quality as well. Help us understand how that fits into this whole picture. Well, thanks so much, Susie, and it's a great opportunity to be here in this really exciting enterprise, so Financial Inclusion 2020. So thinking about the diversity of all of you guys who are participating in the webinar, um, I want you to be, I'd like to respond around three big questions, and these are actually questions that I think the hundreds of you who are listening could be thinking about how can you feed in your insights to the Financial Inclusion 2020 process. So the first question is, how well does finance work for people? The second question is, financial inclusion for what? And the third question is, how to achieve balance in financial inclusion policy? So on that first one, how well does financial, how well do financial services work for people? Um, I think that one of the big questions for the uh, coming five, next five, ten years and this is one that CGAP is also very committed to helping support the field on, is how do we get beyond the physical access, the really exciting developments that Bill and Evelyn have described, to ensuring that services are really diverse and of good quality and safety. And uh, one of the, we think that what, if we can unravel a bit these demand side questions, it'll help answer what is one of the real mysteries in the field right now in terms of all the innovation experimentation, which is why are there so many people that are not taking up services that are available to them or are taking them up but not using them. So we really need to understand better the role of trust, for example, in the choice that consumers make to step over the border from using informal services to formal financial services. On the question of financial inclusion for what, I think we've gotten um, uh, some really great uh, and intriguing ideas from the previous speakers about how payments facilitation could help make all sorts of things more affordable and more possible um, in making services available to people and in promoting bigger global priorities like climate change, food security, or broader-based economic growth. And just to give one example, Evelyn spoke about the MCOPA um, business in Kenya, which is now letting people acquire renewable energy technologies at the household level with very low-cost um, way to make their payments and a low-cost way for the um, technology provider to be able to collect those payments. We can also look at solutions in the area of livelihoods, for instance, payments for environmental services for communities and households that are following certain practices that um, earn rewards, whether in carpet markets or through governments that choose to incentivize that kind of behavior. So I think there are a lot of questions about what financial inclusion can contribute to that goes beyond financial services in a narrow sense. And finally, on the question about how to achieve balance in financial inclusion policy, here we're looking at interests of consumers and providers and societal goals that are ex as expressed um, within policy. And I think over the next five to ten years, um, and CGAP is betting, that we'll be moving beyond the rather primitive assumptions about trade-offs between cost and inclusion and protection and so on, and can start to sort of lay out lay out on the table better analysis about um, what are the policy goals, how can we articulate with greater nuance um, what should be achieved with public policy, and picking up on Bill's comment, we want an enabling environment for innovation and inclusion and scaling that's also protective and promotes quality. So these are each areas where I think that the um, 
the speakers, uh, the participants on the webinar could make important contributions. Kate, thank you so much. And we have Michael Schlein in Boston. And uh, Michael, from your perspective as the CEO of Acción, I know that you know Acción came of age during the microfinance revolution and has since really expanded its portfolio in some very interesting ways. Talk about the role Financial Inclusion 2020 plays in this revolution of expanding access. Thank you, Susie. And, and, and first, let, just let me say thank you to Citi and Visa for uh, not just hosting this call, but really for their decades of support of, of financial inclusion. Um, when we first put this call together, I asked uh, how many people did we expect, and someone said 50 to 60. And so that there are 500 people on this call is, is uh, uh, a testament to, I think we're on to something here. So, so, so thank you. Um, as you said, uh, Axion, we, we came out of the microfinance movement, um, and we've been uh, uh, working in microfinance for over, f over 50 years, and over that time we've helped to build um, 63 microfinance institutions in 31 countries that today uh, serve millions of clients. And I, I, I think um, there was a time where people thought microfinance was um, the answer, uh, and I think that was probably never the case, but I think people have come to recognize that uh, microfinance is uh, part of the answer, but not the answer in and of itself. Um, and uh, the microfinance industry at that time were, you know, largely all nonprofits with a sort of shared sense of values and community, and it, it, it was a movement that was um, um, uh, that, that was fairly co cohesive. Um, over those years, a lot has changed. There was a period when uh, when people talked about the the bottom of the pyramid, and people thought about um, charity and um, even pity and even hopelessness. And today, when you use the phrase the bottom of the pyramid, people are talking about markets. People are talking about opportunity. People are talking about innovation. They're talking about um, double bottom line companies serving people's needs uh, in a sustainable way. And so the, even the language has changed a lot since the early days of the microfinance movement. And as I mentioned, we've, we've sort of... Um, we're now, in, in addition to our microfinance work, we're also doing venture capital for startups in financial services focused on the base of the pyramid. We have our frontier investment group and something we announced this year called uh, Venture Lab, and the two um, are dedicated to help nurture um, startup companies. And the incredible innovation that we're seeing is, is absolutely thrilling, and you're starting to see uh, glimpses of the future um, but that community of companies don't come. They're, they're, it's not like the microfinance movement. They, they they don't see themselves as part of a movement. They don't have a shared heritage. They're not non, You know, they're they're for profit companies. Um, maybe double bottom line companies. What's very exciting about this conference and this financial inclusion 2020 is if we can get them to see that their work is part of a larger movement toward building a financially inclusive world, that would be thrilling. The innovation that we're seeing is breathtaking. And again, as I said earlier, you know, some of these companies will never work out, but some of them can have very, very dramatic impacts in the way that we service the needs of the poor. Michael, thank you so much. And I, I particularly appreciate how you talk about all of us seeing ourselves as part of a larger movement. And I hope that everyone who is on this call will see themselves as part of making this happen. We are about to take questions, or we have been receiving actually quite a few questions, and we'll be starting to address some of those. But the first question I'd like to address came from the National Youth Council in Cameroon. And I, I was particularly delighted uh, to see a question coming from Cameroon and from somebody focused on youth, because youth is one of the client segments that we are looking at, particularly along with rural and women, persons with disabilities, elderly, and refugees and migrants. And that question was a, a wonderful one, which is, how do I get involved? So let's talk about how all of you can get involved in this Financial Inclusion 2020 movement. First of all, a lot is on our website at financialinclusion2020.org. As I mentioned earlier, beginning February 15th, the draft roadmap to financial inclusion on the five different topic areas will be available. We urge you to read the roadmaps and to add your comments. These will very much be drafts. Even though we had expert working groups, there was no way that we could reflect the full diversity of geography and stakeholder type in the inputs to date. And so we are counting on you to fill in the gaps and help keep us 
on the right track with these roadmaps. So please take these as working documents, and we look forward to your comments. The second is the Mapping the Invisible Market findings, which will be available on the website, are available on the website. Those are up now, and we invite you to explore the data and do your own country analysis there. Have fun with it. We hope it will be a, a great tool. We have an FI 2020 blog series that's part of the Center for Financial Inclusion at Axion blog, and we hope you'll follow that series as well as the other good blog posts at the CFI. And we do have a place on our website where you can sign up for FI 2020 updates. Adriana Magdas of our team is coordinating an extensive outreach effort, and you can contact her at amagdas at axion.org to learn how you can be part of our outreach efforts, how you can, in fact, even be an ambassador. For instance, to our friends at the National Youth Council in Cameroon, how can you help us reach out to other organizations focused particularly on youth to make sure that the recommendations from this roadmap are relevant to those groups? And that kind of welcome is extended to all of you to work within your own networks and serve as ambassadors to see how we can bring everybody's perspectives into this project. So those are some of the ways you can get involved. And I'd like to go on to the next question that I thought was foundational and a great one to address. Elizabeth Wine, can you talk to us about the definition of financial inclusion? It's a, it's a pretty basic question, and it's, it's a great one to kick off our Q&A. Thank you, Susie. At the Center for Financial Inclusion, we work with a definition of uh, financial inclusion that is quite comprehensive, and the definition focuses on several pillars, the first pillar being a range of financial services. People need a, a, a range that includes savings, credit, insurance, and payment services. And full financial inclusion means that people would have access to a, a wide variety of those services. The second pillar is a, a pillar on quality, which means uh, that the services are delivered in a way that's convenient for people, that's affordable, that is secure and safe, and uh, that they're provided with dignity for, for the client. The third pillar we are looking to pay special attention to those groups that are often the, the, the most likely to be excluded, including people in remote areas, including people with disabilities, and groups that are particularly likely to have challenges in accessing financial services. The fourth pillar is that all of this has to be embedded in a, a functioning marketplace that, that works in an orderly fashion and with many many players who are all competing. And the final one, which I have to say that we, we added in part through the work on the Financial Inclusion 2020 project, is financial capability. That recognizes that it is extremely important to help people build up their own capacity to be good users of financial services and to make good financial decisions. Thank you, Beth. And uh, another question that I very much welcome is looking at the fact that FI 2020 is not one organization trying to solve full financial inclusion for all independently. It is a broad coalition of many partners who have joined together in this effort. So, Graham, let me kick this question to you. How is FI 2020 working with other initiatives such as the Better Than Cash Alliance, which you're also very involved in, and, and, and many others? Well, certainly in of the partnerships themselves, I think, are quite similar. Many of the partners here in supporting this effort are part of the Better Than Cash Alliance, as an example. And I think what many of you on, on the call may be aware of and certainly should know is that the role of government-to-person payments and cash transfers is, is so large and so enormous and such a potential driver of financial inclusion in securing people's uh, assets, enabling them to, to build assets and preserve them doing so in a transparent way to enable governments to track and use their financial resources more efficiently. And the nature of the Better Than Cash Alliance being zeroed in on electronic government-to-person payments and other forms of payments, I think, is, is built into and integrated into the FI 2020 process naturally, partially because of the partnership with the United Nations Capital Development Fund as the Secretariat, uh, but also because of the key supporters in the steering committee of the Better Than Cash Alliance, of which uh, Gates and Visa uh, are, are among some of them, including City. So I think naturally by partnership, but also I think by issue area, uh, and also 
the actors that really benefit most from uh, electronic person to payments, which clearly are the end beneficiaries themselves, but the governments that are actually most using government to person payments and cash transfers, electronic transfers uh, to benefit their citizens. So I think as we go forward, more integration will happen because as many people may know, Better Than Cash Alliance is recently launched as well. So we are both timed quite well and excited to partner going forward. Thank you, Graham. And Michael, I am going to kick this next tough question to you. This FI2020 project is a very ambitious and, and rather audacious project with a very big vision. How do you reconcile the optimism with the reality that 25% of U.S. households don't have bank accounts? Let's have Evelyn chime in with what do you think, Evelyn, in terms of uh, figures without your computer in front of you, and what do we think? Is, is 25% an accurate figure? I think it's a little high. I think that question was around that was around savings account in the recent FDIC report, or one of the feds put it out. Regardless, the question still stands that many U.S. households do not have savings accounts, although they are financially included in different ways. But okay, and by the way, it's a tiny point. I think that the the a percent of households that really don't have a relationship with a formal service provider is more like 9, 10, 11%. But the important point is that it's going backwards. Yes. Okay. So the financial crisis led to debanking, and the, when you ask consumers why they used to have work with a bank and now they don't, they say, I don't really have enough money to justify it, and they specifically cite fees. And this is a phenomenon that our research is showing is also turning up in places like Mexico. Okay, previously bank people now choosing not to be banked. So we just heard from Evelyn Stark and, and Kate McKee. Michael Schlein, do you have anything you'd like to add about that point? We have an extraordinary financial services sector, uh, not only in the U.S., but around the world. Uh, and yet we know that so many individuals, so many um, small businesses just lack access. They're sort of off the radar. They're not visible to that financial services industry. And whether it's formal or informal, and whether and, and I agree the most disturbing part is is um, we over time we've all we've been moving in one direction, but just recently we're now moving backwards, which is very very disturbing. But again, uh, it's also a huge opportunity with the, the innovation that everyone's talking about on this call and the confluence of new people coming in to try to address the needs of exactly this population. I think it's easy to sort of look at the data see the challenge, but also be optimistic at the opportunity. Thank you, Michael. And as we have a number of questions coming in, we won't be able to get to all of them on this call. And so I, what I can promise is that we will be looking at all of the questions and addressing uh, highlights of, of answers for those on our Financial Inclusion 2020 blog, the FI 2020 blog series. So we hope we'll continue that conversation after today. Meanwhile, Bill Guida, we've had a number of really interesting questions about interoperability. One of the things that is pretty interesting about this project is that we're bouncing back and forth between this very big vision of full financial inclusion for all and yet very specific issues such as interoperability and the technical aspects to it. So one question, for instance, was about migrating to standard rules to set a global product or going with an underlying set of common rules agreed to by emerging countries. So that was one question. TC Mobile's business development unit sent in a question based on their recently licensed mobile money service provider in northern Nigeria and looking at the base of the pyramid and the challenges they have there with telecommunications infrastructure and wondering about alternative platforms. I just wonder if you might like to speak a little bit more about the interoperability technical aspects and some of the ways that you see we can go forward? It's a good question. Both of them are good questions. So, I mean, obviously, Vita spends a lot of time thinking about interoperability. I mean, we are in the payments network business, and, and the scale that, that mobile payments have achieved or payments generally have achieved over the last 50 years is driven by open standards, interoperability, and platforms that can scale. I see, you know, two dynamics working. On the one hand, it really does take the pioneers, primarily mobile network operators in the early days, and more and more banks and mobile operators working together to launch these services and to get them 
within their own sphere to, to a scale um, that's sustainable. But, but we see, as an example, as, as markets mature and several schemes begin to work in one country, the requirement for interoperability becomes greater because people have a demand for these services. They want to send money across the schemes. They do get more sophisticated financial requirements where maybe they want the opportunity to receive money internationally, or maybe governments want to participate in disbursements on mobile. And it's really when you see that, that tipping point of maturity that the role of interoperability, I think, becomes important. I mean, there's really, from my perspective, two ways to drive interoperability. One is we all get on the same platform, but I think that horse has already left the barn. You know, there are several very good platforms out there in the world that are operating the, these mobile money schemes today. And then the other way you can do it is at the network level. So by, and I think it was the second part of the question, which is, you know, can we develop a common product or a common specification or common requirements that would allow at a network level these different physical networks or, or software platforms to communicate? And that's really where Visa's been spending our time. We've developed a product called Visa Mobile Prepaid that, that really does that, that works with any underlying software platform and creates standard rules around how open interoperable transactions can take place either among schemes in an individual market or across markets to provide more payment types and, and really connect people in these schemes to the global payments network. And so we'll continue, I think, to focus on supporting closed loops, you know, and we do that through our fundamental platform and, and our managed service, and we think that they are the initial building blocks to get financial inclusion in these mobile money schemes started, but we're also going to be ready when interoperability is required and, and when markets want to move to that next phase and, and, and provide kind of greater flexibility and, and, and connectivity. And so we see both dynamics happening. Maybe you can repeat the second question, but I thought it was around, actually repeat the second question. Yeah, that, that was looking at a very specific issue in northern Nigeria where they have a technology constraint in the telecommunications infrastructure and are right. trying to figure out about alternative platforms. So just a quick thought about that because we have a, some other questions we want to address as no, well. Very, very quickly. So I, I would say a challenge that all of us face in, in launching and, and growing these mobile money schemes is the, the, the growth and the reliability of the underlying mobile network platforms and the mobile money platforms we put on top of them, I would say that you know, a challenge a mobile network operator has is that they're growing their core business, which, which has a lot of scale and technology and demands at the same time that they're trying to grow a mobile money business. I think that these platforms over time are becoming more robust and more scalable. And, and while we're active in Nigeria as an example as well, and I well appreciate the challenges, I don't think there are any obvious new channels or new technologies that they're going to outpace the benefits of, of just focusing on making those, those mobile money networks kind of more scalable and more reliable. Bill, thanks so much for those thoughts. And I'm going to kick a couple of questions to Kate McKee of CGAP. Kate, uh, the question was, how do we balance financial inclusion and financial integrity, such as any money laundering, <laughs> anti-money laundering policies? And then from Cairo, there's a, another question. How do we protect the poor from predatory offerings? Great. Thank you. Well, let me be really brief. The first question is basically around does financial inclusion help or hurt efforts to rein in money laundering and, and financing of terrorism? And here, I think we have actually some encouraging news. There is growing policy understanding that actually it's financial exclusion is bad for financial integrity and that inclusion by bringing more consumers and more transactions into view back into the radar screen where they can be tracked, it's actually good for financial integrity. And it's uh, noteworthy that the global standard setting body that deals with these issues FATF has recently acknowledged that and is starting to build it into its guidance. So I think that's good news for financial inclusion and that the risks can be managed of uh, letting a whole bunch of people who have smaller financial needs into the system. On the question of predatory practices here, um, let me just make two points. The first is that we need to be really careful to not make assumptions about what people want and what they might find predatory. And here, particularly around like pricing of loans, we find that's often a very inflammatory topic in the media and among policymakers. But when you go to consumers, 
they are valuing uh, convenience and other factors over price. So we need to, I think, get some more nuanced understanding of what matters to consumers here before we start to take aggressive action. My second point is that I think a balance of industry developing standards to promote responsible lending and then regulation helping to create the right incentives and sort of nudge responsible lending behavior is probably the way to go to rein in predatory practices. And we see that approach in markets as diverse as South Africa, the United States, and a number of countries in Latin America now that are trying to deal with overly aggressive lending. Thank you so much, Kate. I want to combine a, a few questions that have talked about government policy and how important the central banks are in advancing financial inclusion. So, Elizabeth Ryan, let me ask you to address how do you propose to engage with central banks and governments? And then one specific question from Sierra Leone was about how aid and donor organizations can influence those government policies in order to enhance financial inclusion. Well, thanks, Susie. Definitely this question is really at the heart of some of the work that we're doing in Financial Inclusion 2020. When I look at the challenge that regulators face in trying to keep up with the fantastic pace of technology change that, um, that we are seeing, and with their recent expanded mandate in the area of consumer protection, my heart goes out to them. Because really they are, they, it is a tremendous challenge. The regulatory frameworks that, that exist are built around the standard con commercial bank, branch bank model, and it's difficult for them to change so fast because when you think about those frameworks, those, they're, they're embedded in legislation, embedded in regulation, embedded in the training that, that regulators and supervisors receive. So I'm very happy to see that these issues are front and center with policymakers today. It's, they're a priority at the G20 level, the formation of the Alliance for Financial Inclusion that allows regulators to talk to each other is it a huge step forward. One of the things that we are most interested in, in doing as part of Financial Inclusion 2020 is promoting greater exchange between the private sector and the provider world, uh, the private sector, the uh, nonprofit sector, and the regulators. We don't see good vehicles for that to happen and then think that that is a priority. Finally, uh, just a word about what role the donors can play. I think, you know, in addition to generally promoting and, and providing examples of, of good practices, there's a huge need for capacity building at the regulatory level to equip regulators to cope with these daunting challenges. Thank you, Elizabeth Ryan. This is the end of this webinar. Many of you asked excellent questions that we couldn't get to on this particular call, and so we will be addressing those in a blog. So keep looking for the FI2020 blog series. And we do urge you to continue to test and, and question and comment on these ideas by looking at the draft roadmaps to financial inclusion, which will be available starting February 15th on the financialinclusion2020.org website. In conclusion, I'd like to thank our founding sponsors for FI2020, City and Visa for their very generous support and strategic leadership throughout this process. Thanks to Bill Guida of Visa for joining us, Graham McMillan of City, Kate McKee of CGAP, Elizabeth Ryan of the Center for Financial Inclusion at Acción, Michael Schlein of Acción, and Evelyn Stark of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for being our guest speakers today. Thanks to each of you for joining us in this important conversation. This is the end of this webinar, but the beginning of building a movement to full financial inclusion for all. And we're grateful that you are joining with us in this effort and look forward to many conversations to come. Farewell. <laughs>